She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. Today we're talking about 40-year-old Richard Bradley Jr. who was arrested in May of 2021 for the murder of 44-year-old Brandy Blake. Brandy's body was found in Game Farm Park, a 160-acre park and wilderness area located in the Seattle suburb of Auburn. But something found near Brandy's remains led law enforcement to discover that Richard Bradley may have been connected to other unsolved crimes. And in the month of December 2023, Bradley has been charged with three additional murders, which have led many to describe him as a newly discovered serial killer, which I don't know how I feel about that term or that description being given to Richard Bradley, but we're going to talk about it. Today, we're going to go over the details and what we know so far. And actually, after that, stay tuned for after we're finished with the Richard Bradley case, because I have uh, something very important to talk to you guys about. Actually, a couple important things to talk to you about a specific case that Derek and I have discussed on Crime Weekly that's currently happening. And I really want to mention it here on this channel because I have a bigger viewership and I want to get this case out there. And I want people to be looking for this person that I'm going to talk about. And I also have a few personal and channel things that I want to discuss with you at the end of the video. So stay tuned. Stay tuned for all of that. We have a lot to talk about. But first, I want to talk to you about a new sponsor, which I'm very, very excited about, Day One. It is a new year, which means it's time to reflect back on your previous year and start figuring out how you're going to make changes in the next year to be better and live a better life. And there's no easier or more effective way to do this than with Day One. Day One is the number one journaling app in the Apple App Store, and it gives journalers of all types a ton of simple and also more advanced features to make journaling not only really easy, but enjoyable and very productive. Everyone should keep a journal, in my opinion, and I've been writing in one almost every day since I was really young, like eight or nine. But we all journal for different reasons. We all have different motivations for why we want to write things down. Whether you use a journal to keep your personal thoughts organized, or maybe you want to log certain parts of your life, like if you're traveling, you want to keep track of your travels, maybe you want to keep track of your relationships, maybe you have a specific goal in mind and you want to keep yourself accountable and keep track of your progress towards that goal. Whatever it is, day one helps you keep your information in an organized and secure place thanks to the app's user-friendly UI and their end-to-end -end encryption. And this is a huge thing for me, a huge thing for me, because I feel that a person should be able to be 100% honest and open in their own journal. But with a physical journal, there's just so much risk of someone picking it up and reading it. And that makes me feel very nervous. And that's actually happened to me more than once. So I love how secure my private thoughts are with day one. There are so many features available on day one, even with just the basic plan, including daily reminders to write. And I love their templates because day one does have a daily prompt that you can take advantage of. But I love the templates because they act as a prompt for me because I'm trying to write every single day because I want to like get everything out and process it better. And this gives you the option to so you can do the template called one photo, which says today's photo, then you can add the photo and then you can talk about the story behind the photo. You have a daily goal plan as a template, a bullet journal, a to do list. 
they have a template that's called decision making. And it says, what is the decision I need to make? When do I need to make this decision? What is the decision outcome of this decision that I hope to achieve? They even have a recipe template. So if you want, you can keep track of your recipes in this day one app. They have a food journal where you can track your breakfast, lunch, snacks, dinner, and make notes. They also have a weekly meal plan, a fitness log, even a habit tracker and a mood tracker, a dream template. So all of these things are super important to keep track of and be aware of. And I love that the templates allow you to do that. You also have the ability to print your journal into a physical book, which is wonderful because one of my day one journals will actually have three separate ones for each one of my kids, and I use it for writing about my kids every day. What are they currently into? Funny or cute things they said, sweet moments we shared with each other, so I can track them as they grow and change, and so I can remember because our minds are so full of extraneous stuff, we sometimes let the important stuff slip. And each year I want to print these journals out and give them to my kids so that one day when they're grown, they can read them and get a peek into their lives as children, our lives together as a family. Maybe they can show their own families. Maybe they can take some of these traditions and further them with their own children. But they also have a premium day one account that allows you to not only have more than one journal, which I have the premium account, so I have multiple journals, you get unlimited journals. So you can have a personal one, you can have one for each one of your kids, one for tracking your workouts and meals, but with premium, you can add unlimited photos and videos to your journal. You can really create so much more texture and context to your words with these pictures and videos of what you're writing about. You can also add unlimited audio recordings. And I will say this is less of a happy occasion, but people going through a divorce or planning to get divorced or dealing with any civil legal situation will appreciate this because we all know that lawyers love you to have everything in writing organized with proof and times and dates. So if you're writing in your day one journal about what's happening that that day and you can add supporting pictures, videos, even audio recordings of arguments or abusive behavior, you'll have a better chance of things going your way in court. Day one also has an amazing search feature. So if you're trying to locate a certain date where a person said or did something to you, you can use search terms to locate the entry where you wrote about it. Let's say somebody called you a mean name. Now you can type that mean name in and find out every occasion that they used it with you. You can also scan documents to PDF and add them to your entries. And right now I have a great offer for you because day one's going to give you two months to try premium out for yourself. All you have to do is go to dayoneapp.com slash Harlow and use code Harlow to take advantage of this very special limited time offer. I also love that with premium, you get 25% off every time you want to transform one of your online journals into a physical book. And day one has free apps for iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch, Mac, and Android. And everything you write goes into the cloud so you can switch easily between devices. You can switch between using your computer or laptop to write, which is my preference because I can type so much faster than I can write with my hand these days. And I don't have to deal with my hand cramping as I release my thoughts onto the paper. But if I have something to add or I need to make a quick note, I can pick up my phone and do that easily. I can add voice notes and things. But with a premium account, you're also going to get unlimited voice to text transcription, which once again is wonderful. And please do not forget, Day One is going to offer you a free two-month trial of their premium account when you go to dayoneapp.com slash Harlow and use code Harlow. I am personally so happy that I started using Day One because it has made journaling not only easier and faster, so it's something I can definitely fit into my day, but it's enjoyable. I love all of their features. It, it gives me a feeling like I'm actually curating my thoughts instead of just writing them down. I'm curating them. I'm making them something special that has all of these other things to support them, like pictures and videos and things. And I love, I love that I feel very safe knowing that Day One's end-to-end -end encryption and security measures will ensure that only those who I want to view my private thoughts will be able to. I love it. So once again, go to dayoneapp.com slash Harlow and use code Harlow to try a premium feature-packed account of Day One for two months completely free. Give it a try and see if daily journaling can do for you what it's done for me and so many others. So once again, thank you to Day One for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in. Okay, so Game Farm Park is located in Auburn, Washington. And according to the town's website, the park emphasizes a connection with the natural environment. It has a limited development and it has preserved most of the native woodlands along the White River. The park has large wooded areas, hiking paths, basketball courts, playgrounds, and picnic areas, and it can accommodate both daytime and overnight visitors, which I assume to mean campers for overnight visitors. But later they're going to talk about residents of the park and 
we're going to discuss that when it pops up because I'm not sure what they mean by residents of the park. But for the purposes of today's video, we're going to work backwards, starting with the fourth and final murder that Richard Bradley Jr. is charged with committing. But law enforcement believes that Bradley used the same tactics with all of his victims. He used the promise of buried gold to lure them into the woods where he would kill them and bury their bodies and basically rob them afterwards because allegedly all of these people would either have large amounts of cash on their person at all times or they had just come into a large amount of cash that somehow Bradley was able to get access to. So 44-year-old Brandy Blake was reported missing by family members in May of 2021. Brandy had been in contact with family members, but when she stopped responding to calls and texts and she was no longer active on social media, people started calling the police because they were concerned. During the investigation into Brandy's whereabouts, detectives spoke to her niece, who told them that Brandy had been with Richard Bradley Jr. and Bradley's wife on May 5th. She had apparently taken them to a hotel room in Federal Way. I believe that this was a hotel room she was living in because some sources said that she took them to her apartment. Some sources said she took them to her home. Most of the sources agreed that it was a hotel in Federal Way, and Federal Way is a city in Washington, just about seven miles from Auburn. So I believe it was a hotel room that Brandy was living in, residing in. And then after being in that hotel room, Richard Bradley, his wife, and Brandy all paid a visit to Brandy's storage unit. Friends of Brandy's confirmed that Bradley had met with her at the Federal Way Hotel, at which time Richard Bradley told Brandy that he needed her help digging up some gold he had stashed in the park from a previous burglary. So basically, Richard Bradley Jr. said, I stole a bunch of gold when I robbed this place and I buried it in the park. And if you help me dig this gold up and locate it, we can sell it and make a nice profit that we will split, right? And I mean, I don't know what the whole process of the conversation was. I'm not sure what kind of establishment Richard Bradley Jr. is robbing where he's getting gold. You know, I, I, I kind of figured that gold is usually stored in like banks, safety deposit boxes, things like that. I don't think that you can just walk into like a CVS and say, give me all the gold in your cash register. So once again, I'm not sure what Richard Bradley Jr. told Brandy to convince her that he had all of this gold buried in the park, but he did. Maybe he said he personally robbed somebody who had a safe and they had like bars of gold in there, but it's just confusing to me, I guess, why he wouldn't have told them he had cash buried in the woods because that would be more believable. The whole gold thing is less believable. But once again, maybe using the promise of gold, which changes in value and you know could bring in a good deal of money from just a small amount of gold, maybe that made it more believable for these people. I want you to keep in mind that the four victims that Richard Bradley Jr. attacked, allegedly, because he's been charged, he hasn't been convicted, they all had something in common, which is they didn't necessarily live on the right side of the law. Now, this does not make them any less valuable as people. This does not make them any less sympathetic as victims. It simply means that because of the kinds of crowds that they ran in, they were able to run into Richard Bradley Jr. And when he asked them to do something a little bit illegal and illicit, they weren't like, Ugh, we don't want to be involved in, in this. We don't want to be involved in any gold that you got from a robbery. They were all about being a part of this and helping Bradley locate this gold, dig it up, and then sell it for a profit. Now, surveillance video from a Walgreens in Auburn shows Brandy and Richard Bradley Jr. arriving to this Walgreens in Brandy's Ford Mustang. They entered the store together, and then they exited the store together not long after, and then they drove away. But two hours later, Richard Bradley Jr. was seen at the Federal Way Hotel alone, 
and he arrived driving Brandy's Mustang and wearing the same clothes that he had been seen wearing in the Walgreens surveillance footage. Law enforcement would later claim that they had found blood on these clothes and on the shoes that Richard Bradley wore that day. And Richard Bradley's wife, who was obviously later questioned by police, she confirmed that her husband and Brandy had left the hotel room earlier that day together, but he had arrived back alone. And Richard Bradley told his wife that Brandy had given him permission for them to drive her car. Now, Brandy's Ford Mustang was found abandoned on May 13th in Tacoma, 14 miles away from Auburn. And police noted that the license plates had been removed, and it appeared as if some kind of cleaning agent had been used to wipe down the exterior of the vehicle. During the investigation, detectives discovered a few things about Brandy Blake. She was involved in the buying and selling of drugs. She had recently won $20,000 at the casino. She always kept large amounts of cash on her person, and she happened to have a key to Game Farm Park in Auburn. Once again, they do not explain why Brandy had a key to this park. And you'd think that you wouldn't need a key to get into a park, but I'm sure there are some areas that get locked up at night where they don't want people kind of wandering into the wilderness in the dark at night alone. So they secure certain areas and maybe that's what she had a key to, but they do not explain how Brandy had a key and what this key actually accessed or what area of the park it accessed. Now, since Brandy Blake had last been seen with Richard Bradley Jr., police searched his RV on May 21st, and there they found three guns, one of which belonged to Brandy Blake, and a backpack which reportedly contained three pounds of meth, a pound of heroin, and over 1,000 Percocet pills. Also in the backpack was a receipt from Walgreens dated May 5th, which led police to that location where they were then able to view the surveillance video and they realized that this Walgreens location was just a three-minute drive from Game Farm Park. On May 26th, police and search dogs descended on the park and they began to search for Brandy Blake. They were able to speak to a resident of the park who gave them some information. And I mentioned this earlier, I'm not sure what they mean by this when they say a resident of the park. I'm not familiar with this park. I'm not familiar with this area. And I did do some Googling to try to figure out if people actually live in Game Farm Park or maybe there's homes located on the outskirts of the park and those people who live there have access to certain areas of the park because of where they live. I couldn't really get an answer, but I will say I found no evidence that there are homes around Game Farm Park where people can be considered residents of the park. So I wondered if they meant maybe this resident was an unhoused individual who's made the park his home. But either way, this man's story is actually kind of incredible. He told the police that a few weeks prior, at around 9 p.m. at night, he'd heard someone calling for help. So he ventured out and he found a man who matched the description of Richard Bradley Jr. And this man was wandering around, lost in the dark in the park. And the park resident helped the lost man, who he claims was carrying a folding shovel and a backpack. And he helped this man find his way back to his vehicle parked on the road. Guess what the vehicle was? It was a Ford Mustang, the same car owned by Brandy Blake. Now, a few days later, the resident of the park claimed that the man with the backpack and the folding shovel and the Mustang, he returned to the park and he gave this resident a large bag of meth to thank him for his help. Now, was the meth really to thank the person or to keep them quiet, right? (laughs) I mean, somebody who's on an immense amount of meth is not going to be really concerned with what's happening in the news. Are there missing people? Who's looking for Brandy Blake? This person is not going to be going to the police all messed up on meth and be like, hey, I saw a guy with a shovel right at the same time that Brandy Blake went missing right in the same location that they were last known to be, right? That's not going to happen. So was the meth a thank you present? Or was it like, here, get all messed up so that you're not aware of what day it is, where you're at, or what the hell's going on around you? Now, I don't know if the resident did the meth or consumed it or what this person did with the meth. But either way, this witness appeared to be completely with it because he was able to show police the location where he had found the lost man wandering around in the dark. And so the police 
concentrated their search to an area of the park south of the White River. And within 90 minutes of them narrowing down where Richard Bradley Jr. was seen by the park resident, they found the body of Brandy Blake. She was lying face down in a shallow, poorly covered grave, and the medical examiner would later determine that she had died from multiple blunt force injuries. Now, there was a second hole found next to Brandy's body, like a hole dug in the dirt. And inside that hole, police found a shovel, a pickaxe, and a card key from the Federal Way Hotel where Brandy had been staying. But they found something else near Brandy's body. Three rib bones were found 30 feet away from where her body was located, but investigators did not believe that these bones belonged to Brandy because they were basically completely bare of flesh and Brandy had not been dead long enough for her body to decompose to that extent. The bones were tested and found to be human. And using DNA, investigators were able to discover that these three rib bones had belonged to a man named Emilio Raul Maturin, who'd been missing since July of 2019. Police believe that 36-year-old Emilio Maturin was Bradley's first victim because when Emilio's girlfriend reported him missing, she told police that just before her boyfriend vanished, he'd been talking to a man named Richard Bradley Jr. about a plan to dig up some buried gold. Now, apparently they had not discussed this directly in front of her. She'd been in a different room and she just kind of overheard what they were talking about. But this conversation had happened on July 18th, 2019. And the woman said that her boyfriend, Emilio Maturin, had been skeptical about Bradley's buried gold claims, but the two drove off in Emilio's brand new BMW anyways, because Emilio was like, well, let's just check it out. What's the worst that could happen? If there's gold there, great. If there's not, then, you know, I know this guy's full of shit. But when Emilio didn't return home and he became unresponsive, his girlfriend was able to track his cell phone to Game Farm Park. She drove there. She was kind of like looking for him, but then she got really frightened and she left the area. That same day, Auburn police found an unregistered BMW parked near a large field at the park. And according to charging documents, they also found what was described as a large piece of heroin in the car. Once again, wish I had more information because how did you find a piece of heroin in the car? Was the car unlocked? Was a chunk of heroin just chilling like out in the open? You could see it on the seat or it was like just on, I don't know, the dashboard or something. Like how did you see a large piece of heroin in the car? Because I'm pretty sure police need probable cause to enter a vehicle that that is not registered to them or does not belong to them, right? They need like a warrant. They need probable cause. They need something. And so I'm not sure how they saw the drugs, the heroin, and how they knew it was heroin, but maybe they just saw something that made them suspect it was heroin. And then they didn't actually enter the car because what ended up happening is the police waited for the driver of the BMW to return so they could like question this person about the heroin. But when the guy came back and they tried to approach him, he took off in the BMW, leading police on a car chase that ended with the driver being arrested. And he was then charged with eluding police. Now, the man arrested was Richard Bradley Jr. And he told the police that the car belonged to a friend of his. And then apparently they just let him go. Now, this could be because Emilio's girlfriend did not report him missing to the police until two weeks after he disappeared. So at that time when they had Bradley in custody, law enforcement had no way of knowing a crime had been committed. And so they released him. But still, was it heroin? Did you just take his word that this wasn't his car and that the heroin wasn't his, you'd think that there'd be some sort of questioning that they would want to actually see who the car was registered to and then question that person. Maybe they did try to do all of that, but they couldn't find Emilio. And maybe because he had a record of his own, they kind of just assumed that whatever Richard Bradley Jr. was saying was true and Emilio was on the run because it would later be revealed that Emilio Maturin was involved in drug dealing and he always kept large amounts of cash and drugs on his person whenever he left the house. So when he left with Richard Bradley on July 19th, Emilio reportedly had $15,000 in cash in his pocket. Now, that's going to bring us to 59-year-old Michael Goman and his son, 31-year-old Vance Lakey. Apparently, these two men did not have a home. 
I don't know what their circumstances were, what their situation was, that they did not have a place to live, but reportedly they had been living in a tent together. However, right before they disappeared, Michael Goman had received an inheritance, and apparently this inheritance was pretty sizable, and it allowed him to purchase a Dodge Durango SUV for $3,500, at which point he and his son Vance Lakey began living in that vehicle. Now, in late April, the bodies of Michael Goman and Vance Lakey were found a week apart in a remote area of Game Farm Park. Goman had died from a single gunshot wound to the head, and his son, Vance Lakey, had died from multiple gunshot wounds to the head. After their bodies were located, detectives interviewed a person who knew Richard Bradley Jr., and this man claimed that Bradley had offered him $1,000 to break into the impound lot where Michael Goman's Dodge Durango was being kept and set that vehicle on fire. Bradley had told this man to make sure the front seats were completely destroyed in the fire, and Bradley's wife had allegedly given this man a can of gasoline in order to do this job. Now, this person reportedly cut the fence surrounding the impound lot, but once he was inside, he decided not to go ahead with setting the Dodge Durango on fire. On May 21st, 2021, Richard Bradley Jr. was arrested and charged with the murder of Brandy Blake. A charge for the murder of Emilio Maturin was added on December 5th, 2023, and a week later, charges for the second-degree murders of Michael Goman and Vance Lakey were also added. According to law enforcement, Bradley was the last person seen with all four victims, and he and his wife were seen driving the victims' vehicles after they went missing. Police believe that Bradley's motive was to lure his victims to an isolated area where he could kill and rob them for whatever money and or drugs they had on their person. Now, at this point, Bradley has pleaded not guilty to all four murder charges, and he's scheduled to go on trial for the murder of Brandy Blake next month, which is going to be January 2024. And then from there, depending on what happens with that trial, we'll probably see further trials follow or they will tell Richard Bradley Jr. and his lawyer what kind of evidence and information they have that implicates him in these crimes, and he might just make a deal for all four crimes or end up deciding to kind of forego a trial if the evidence is strong enough, and it appears that it is, and there's so much that they're not telling us, right? So they claim they have clothes with blood on them that belong to Richard Bradley Jr., and this blood would be allegedly Brandy Blake's blood. They also have, you know, evidence that he was with her the day she went missing. They have evidence that he had her car and he was driving around, evidence from his own wife, who I'm going to mention in a minute. They have a gun found in Bradley's RV that belonged to Brandy, and that gun, or one of the other guns, because they found three altogether, most likely matched the bullets that were found in Michael Goman and Vance Lakey. We also have law enforcement placing Richard Bradley Jr. at the scene of the crime the same day that Emilio Maturin went missing. They not only have placed him at Game Farm Park, but they've placed him in the victim's vehicle. So to me, it seems pretty much cut and dry, like it's all wrapped up, just based on what we know, because we don't know what they found in that Dodge Durango that belonged to Michael Goman and his son Vance Lakey. Thank God this guy who was paid a thousand dollars to set it on fire did not set it on fire because the only reason that Bradley and his wife would want this vehicle especially those front seats set on fire is because there's some evidence that probably connects him to the murders of Michael Goman and Vance Lakey and that's why he wanted it set on fire or else why would he care so police will have whatever evidence they retrieved from the Dodge Durango as well and hopefully they can kind of wrap this all up it doesn't have to be some long drawn out expensive trial multiple trials because we have multiple victims but I guess my question for you would be do you think that this guy Richard Bradley Jr. can be sort of described as a serial killer because for me Yes, he's killed more than one person, and he did so in a you know fairly short period of time. But the motive to do so was basically money, some financial benefit to him, or drugs, you know, because he's got a lot of drugs, and now he can sell those drugs for money. So is it really the fact that he's a serial killer? To me, a serial killer is somebody who doesn't really have much of a motive besides wanting to kill people, just getting like pleasure or a thrill or like a hit of dopamine from taking lives. If you have such a human sort of base 
motive, like I just want their money. Is it really a serial killer or is this just a guy who encountered a bunch of people who kind of stayed on the wrong side of the law, who maybe nobody would really miss that much? And he thought, here's a way for me to financially benefit from these people's deaths. So I will kill them so that I can benefit. It's not so much a serial killer as just like a bad guy, a bad guy who you know, didn't want to work for a living and thought instead that he could just kill people and steal their money. Because yes, all of these people did carry large amounts of cash and or drugs on them. So it would make sense that that was his motive. And that was his only motive. There doesn't seem to be any evidence that Richard Bradley Jr. got some pleasure or joy to take these people's lives. He didn't seem to be under some sort of compulsion to do it, like some of the serial killers we've talked about. It just seems for him the end justified the means, and he just wanted their money and whatever else they had to give him. But let me know what you think about this case in the comments below. I'm sure more will be coming out. Actually, let me see if anything else has come out. Nothing new has been reported about this case, which I'm not surprised about. They're keeping everything close to the chest until these trials happen. But what I am curious about is Richard Bradley Jr.'s wife. Has she been questioned by the police to the point where she's either going to be charged next to him? Because it appears that she was a little bit involved, you know, maybe not with the murders, but definitely with, you know, the before and the after of the murders. She was with her husband and Brandy Blake the day that Brandy went missing. She was seen driving around in these vehicles with her husband. She gave, allegedly gave this guy a can of gas to set the Dodge Durango on fire that belonged to Michael Goldman and Vance Lakey. She's somehow connected and involved with all four of these victims. And she's his wife. So you'd think she probably knew a little bit about what was happening because how many times are you going to, you know, introduce your wife to somebody or tell your wife that you're with somebody and then all of a sudden this person is letting you borrow their vehicle and drive it around? Like how many times is that going to fly? So in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, allegedly, don't come for me. It's only speculation. I have no proof or evidence. But based on context clues, it appears to me that Richard Bradley Jr.'s wife probably knew what was happening. She knew what the plan was. You know, her husband's coming into money all of a sudden every time one of these people go missing. Like, it's just, it's a little too convenient. So my question is, is she going to be charged next to him? Or are they going to find a way to get her to testify against him or cooperate with law enforcement to help take him down? So I know that we're all familiar with the fact that spouses typically cannot be compelled to testify against each other in a court of law during a criminal case. But there are some exceptions. And I actually know this because Derek and I covered the Lindsay Clancy case on Crime Weekly. And I read an article which was on Inside Edition, I believe, basically asking, like, will Patrick Clancy testify against his wife, Lindsay? Can he do that? And there was a divorce attorney named Ken Jewell of Jewell Law, and he told Inside Edition that, yes, that's typically true, but there are some exceptions to this. So he said, quote, there are a few instances where the spouse can be forced to testify, the commission of a crime amongst spouses, any communications made in the presence of a third party, or emails sent from email systems. And Jewel said the only other exception is any allegations of child abuse. So I wonder if because this wife, Bradley's wife, may have participated in the commission of these crimes with her husband if that kind of takes away any, you know, ability to protect her from testifying against him. And she may just have the choice, right? It may be a protection as in like you don't have to testify against your spouse. But if you want to, right, if you want to save your own ass, if you would like to make a deal so that you don't do time for this and you have information that the police could use, you can at least make a deal with them or testify against your husband in court. So I'm going to be very interested to see what role the wife plays in this case. I'm going to be very interested to see what kind of involvement she had in these crimes and if she does strike a deal and somehow works with law enforcement to put her husband behind bars. Now, if she had a bigger hand in these crimes than I'm even thinking, you know, if it was more than just being present or handing somebody a gas can and she was actually part of planning and executing these murders, then she probably will take her spousal privilege to not testify against her husband and to not incriminate herself. But we will see what happens. Now, 
That's all for that case. But there is another important case currently happening. And I really want to talk about it because I really want everybody to be on the lookout for this young woman. And I feel very, very compelled to talk about this right now because for the last week or so, I have seen the mother of 20-year-old Layla Santanello all over TikTok, and it's been breaking my heart because she's sitting like by a Christmas tree. She's sitting in a chair, and basically what she's saying is like, my daughter's been missing for so long, and this is the first Christmas that I have to spend without her, and like, this is terrible. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I feel like my life is coming to an end, and I would really like if people would just help tell us what you know about where Layla is, uh, tell us if you know anything, keep a lookout for her, and I feel like this woman, Layla's mother, she needs some help here. She needs some support. She needs a community behind her, and we can be that community. So 20-year-old Layla Santanello was last seen in her hometown of Kingstown, Tennessee. She was last seen at an ice cream shop on North Eastman Road on June 27th, 2023. This was one of those um, marble slab ice cream places. She was reportedly seen barefoot and in a state of apparent distress. Layla asked to borrow the cell phone of someone who worked at the ice cream shop, and then she left and told this person that she was going across the street two five below to buy a pair of shoes. After this, she was not seen again, and I don't think she ever did make it to five below. According to Layla's mother, Jennifer Santanello, Layla and her boyfriend had a falling out uh, recently before she went missing, and Layla had been staying with a friend for a few nights, and then she checked into the AmeriCourt Motel on June 25th. But witnesses told Layla's mother, Jennifer, that when Layla arrived at the motel, she looked disheveled. She appeared to be paranoid, as if she was kind of trying to hide from everyone. And on June 26th, other guests at the motel saw Layla going door to door, wearing a white tank top, black leggings, and no shoes. And Layla's mother, Jennifer, said, quote, there was some kind of commotion happening in another part of the hotel, and the people that were outside that night saw her just kind of freak out and take off across the parking lot into the woods behind the motel. She apparently stayed in those woods until the morning. When she got up, she was seen coming across a field next to a warehouse where one man said it looked like she was trying to find something in the grass. She asked someone for a cigarette, but they didn't smoke, and then she took off in the direction of the Kingsport Greenbelt Trail. And this is the part that really gets me. So if anyone saw her that morning, please come forward. Around noon, an employee at the marble slab found her on the back patio sitting under an umbrella at one of the tables. She looked disheveled, distraught, and distressed. So she gave her ice cream and they chatted for a bit. She told her she was going to Five Below to buy shoes, but she never made it. End quote. Like I said, after leaving that ice cream shop, Layla's trail went completely cold. And Jennifer Santanello says none of this really makes sense, right? It doesn't make sense because Layla's never been afraid of anything. She's never seen her daughter in the state that witnesses remember seeing Layla, paranoid and hiding in the shadows and disheveled and just out of it. And Jennifer said that the thought of Layla sleeping in a field all night absolutely breaks her heart and she has no idea why Layla would do this when she had a motel room. And apparently a lot of people do suspect Layla's boyfriend had something to do with it. Derek and I did speculate about that, but Jennifer Santanello does not believe that he does. She thinks he's been pretty open and honest. She thinks that he's told them everything that, you know, he knows. He's the one who went to the motel and searched for Layla, and he seemed just as confused about Layla sleeping in the field as Jennifer did. So he seems genuinely to not understand what's going on. Again, the authorities, and they have a lot more evidence, and they have done a lot more investigating than I could ever even dream of doing in this situation. They don't believe the boyfriend had anything to do with it. I've had a hard time believing he could do that, what you're thinking. I know this boy. I've known him a long time. He and Lila were friends a very, very long time before they started dating. Um, and it's hard for me, but it's always hard for me to see that kind of thing in people. I, I, I choose to see the good in everyone. So, um, as far as what I think, it changes every day. It changes every hour, honestly. Um, why was she out in that field? I don't know. When that information came to me, first off, her boyfriend is the one who originally discovered that information. And when he said that, I didn't believe him. I didn't believe him for a second. 
Truly. She didn't sleep in a field. You're a crazy person. Yeah, she did. She slept in a field. And and then, then she went to the marble slab and got ice cream. And I was like, you... Son, you have lost your mind. You're going too far with the fibs, okay? But turns out, investigators went and questioned everybody that the boyfriend had talked to. And it turns out that that was 100% accurate. And when they told me that she for sure spent that night in the field, she spoke to me that morning. No, that's the morning before. And when they said that she spent that night, like my stomach dropped. Like I was on a roller coaster. The idea of her out there exposed like that. And it blew my mind. Because, listen, Layla and I were not best friends. We didn't have the greatest relationship. I'm not even going to try and lie and say that we did. We were at each other's throats half the time. We butted heads. We had very different perspectives on life. But I always showed up. She knew always that she could call and I would come. I never didn't come. So for her to not grab one of those witnesses' phones and call me, she knows my number by heart. It's been the same number for like a decade and she has it imprinted on her mind. She could have called. I don't know why she didn't. I ask myself that question all the time. Now, there has been more information that's come out since Derek and I talked about this on Crime Weekly, and I want to share this with you now. And then I'm going to share a number for you to call if you know anything about where Layla Santanello is because her mother's desperately looking for her, and we can at least help. So this article says that Layla vanished just a few days after an argument with her live-in boyfriend. And it's believed now that that argument was about another man that Layla was seeing, and this is according to Layla's stepmother, Brittany Zeitler. The article goes on to say that Layla reportedly fled without any belongings from the home that she shared with her then-partner, who has not been identified but has been helping with, you know, trying to get Layla's name out there and everything. She then spent a few nights couch surfing with friends, including her mysterious supposed new love interest. And this is once again according to the stepmother, Brittany. Layla then checked into the motel on June 25th where another friend was staying and other guests recall seeing her go door to door in distress. She had another altercation at the hotel with someone who was not identified before marching off into the woods. The stepmother said, quote, based on her paranoia, her panicking, and her being freaked out, it could be that she was running from whoever she spoke with at the motel, end quote. Now, in this other article, it says that Layla Santanello's mom shares serial killer fears and chilling adults and kids' bodies link to missing Holly Ann Snap. So who's Holly Ann Snap? Well, Holly Ann Snap is a 19-year-old girl who vanished on October 15th in Kingsport, just two and a half miles from where Layla Santanello was last seen. And so Holly Ann vanished about four months after Layla went missing. Now, both Jennifer and Holly Ann's mothers believe that these two cases could be connected because both of the women kind of resemble each other. Layla and Holly Ann kind of resemble each other. They're both shorter. They're under five feet. They're of similar build. They kind of look childlike. And the two women were also part of the same social circles and they knew many of the same people. This article says that neither of these two women have been heard from since and both were believed to be in a vulnerable state at the time of their disappearances. Holly Ann had suffered from addiction and mental health issues and her parents told the media that she operated at the mental capacity of a nine or 10 year old. Her family said it's completely unlike Holly Ann to cut off all communication, adding that they're particularly concerned because of how she is and how she's a little more trusting of people. Now, in the weeks since Layla and Holly Ann's families have been in communication and their mothers have realized that they believe these two cases are linked, they have come to the conclusion that Holly Ann and Layla probably knew each other. And Jennifer Santanello, Layla's mother, said she believes that the similarities, the physical similarities between the two girls, as well as their perceived links and the social circles that they ran in, 
It could mean a number of things. She said, quote, a lot of things pop into my head. I wonder about trafficking, but also aren't serial killers the type to pick a specific height and weight and that kind of thing? Those are the thoughts that hadn't fully occurred to me until we had another girl going missing. There could be a serious problem going on around here. There are a lot of theories that roll through my head over and over every day. It's a scary world we live in these days. Anything is possible, end quote. And she's so right. It is a completely scary world that we're living in today, and anything is possible. But either way, these two young women are still missing. Their families are now working together to try and bring them home. Uh, It was Holly Ann's mother that basically said it takes a village to raise a child, and I believe it's going to take a village to either bring them home or find out what happened to them. And I agree. So let's be their village. Let's be their community. I can't take watching Leila's mother on TikTok just devastated anymore this is not fair and there's people in the comments being like mean to her like there's one video where she's crying in a chair by the christmas tree and on the screen it basically says like this is the first christmas that i'm going to have without my daughter i'll put it up if i can find it again which i'm sure i will be able to but and there's people in the comments like what did you do just set your camera up and then press record and then go sit in a chair and cry like oh how staged and it's like shut up what's wrong with people what is wrong with people i literally think i like i never respond to anybody on TikTok, like in other people's TikToks, I never write anything. But I think I was like, what is actually wrong with you that that's what you took from this? Like this mother is grieving. She doesn't know where her daughter is. And you know who else is suffering this time of year? Layla's child, Nova, because Layla had a small daughter who she left behind at the time of her disappearance. And this child had to celebrate Christmas without her mother. So this is devastating. Let's see if we can bring Layla home. There is a $2,000 reward that Jennifer Santanello has put up, but let's not do it for the reward. Let's just do it and, and keep our eyes out and share this and share Layla's information and Layla's story so that more people can be aware of what's happening and more people can be out there looking for her, keeping an eye out, et cetera, et cetera. So anyone with any information about Layla or Holly Lynn is asked to call the Kingsport Police Department at 423-343-9780. If you know anything, even the smallest thing can help. If you think you saw one of them, if you think you know them, if you think that there's somebody the police haven't thought about who might be involved with what happened to them, if you know these girls or know the circles that they run in or know anything about where they could be or about what could have happened to them, please call, please call. Uh, do something you can put in an anonymous tip so if you're worried about you know certain people finding out that you gave information don't be but please if you know something do something it's the right thing to do it really is Uh, we need to give these families some answers and if it's possible to bring Layla and Holly Lynn home then we should be doing everything we can for them and for their families. So I will put all the information up on the screen as far as the number to call. I will put their missing posters up on the screen and all the information will also be in the description box. And I really just wanted to get that out before the end of the year because it's important. Um, It's important. These two girls are missing and their families are devastated. Like I just don't know what else to say about it because I really want some sort of movement to happen here. I want them to be brought home. I want us to have answers about what happened to them. Okay, all of that being said, I have a few things to tell you about. First of all, if you have not yet checked out the web series, Serial, I implore you to do so because it's amazing. For those of you who do not know, I have been acting in a uh, web series that's on YouTube and it's being directed, written, and produced by the Coleman brothers, Vince and James, who are close personal friends of mine. I think that together we've created something truly beautiful. It's shot beautifully. It looks great. The acting in it is really good. The storyline is good. Basically, Serial follows two serial killers, Harold and Mabel. I'm Mabel. And for the first season, which we have wrapped up on, it goes back and forth between Harold's episodes and Mabel's episodes. And it's kind of showing the path that they're each taking in their own lives that are eventually going to have them meeting and and coming together and, and basically their worlds colliding. It is a horror series. So in each episode, there is a new murder and we're going to have so much happening with these murders. We found a way to connect them. There's Easter eggs. There's callbacks. It's just really wonderfully well well written, beautifully shot, and I'm having so much fun doing it, and I want everybody to really check it out, take advantage of it, 
you know, this is free entertainment that I think is is excellent. So check it out. Let me know what you think about it. If you could actually watch it and then personally email me and let me know what you think about it. If you're familiar with film, if you're really into film and you have some ideas, you have some creative ideas that you where you might want to see the story go, kind of like a choose your own adventure thing, let me know. I'm very interested to see what everybody thinks about it. And I really want everybody to check it out because I think that it's just probably one of the best things I've been involved with creatively. It has stimulated me it's given me so much joy and enjoyment and happiness and just like this creative outlet that I really desperately needed it means a lot to me and I want to share it with everybody so I'm going to link the playlist for cereal in the description box also we have a special Christmas episode that acted as a bridge between season one and season two I think it's one of the best episodes yet I get to play a murderous little elf and it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun to to be somebody else. That's why acting is so fun. And honestly, I don't think I'd ever do it for any money, but I love doing it just because pretending to be somebody else for a time is a an amazing escape that I don't think enough people appreciate. So go and check it out. I would really appreciate it. And I also sadly want to tell you that in January, we aren't going to have any videos. <laughs> I feel so bad, but listen, there's a lot of reasons for this. I'm still going to be doing Crime Weekly, so Derek and I are going to be putting out content as usual for Crime Weekly, but personally, I'm feeling a bit burnt out, and I kind of want to go into 2024 with just a new lease on life. I want to take January and do research on cases that I've been wanting to cover on my channel, but haven't had the time to really like delve into the cases enough to kind of be putting out content consistently and really taking a lot of time to research these cases. So I want to do that. I want to spend time with my family because the past few years has been mainly me working a lot and I kind of miss out on everything. Like the kids and the family are in the pool swimming and I'm inside working or they're going out and doing fun things for the holidays and I'm inside working. And I love to work. And honestly, if left to my own devices, I would never leave the house and I would always work because I'm happiest doing that. But I also understand that I need to live and I need to um, have these memories, these personal memories, not just work memories. And while my professional life is strong, right, my work life is strong, my personal life is a little weak and I need to kind of get it up there with my professional life. So at least we're a little evened out and balanced. So we have some plans for family trips. Adam and I are taking a trip um, at the end of January and there's just, you know, things that I want to do. I want to like organize my house because it's an absolute... <laughs> mess. There's there's just things that I've been wanting to do and I never had enough time for them. So I'm going to take January to do that, but I will be working. I will be working on cases so that when we go into February, we're, we have a strong start to the new year. You know, I kind of go into February and go into 2024 in a surplus because I've already researched and, you know, put together some cases to talk about with you guys. And I'll go live in January a few times just so we don't miss each other too much because I know we will. I know we will miss each other. And I can't just go a whole month without talking to you guys. And if you're not following following me on Instagram, go follow me on Instagram. The Everything is in the description box. It's just Stephanie Harlow on Instagram. But go follow me because I'm always updating people about things in my story and talking to you guys in my story. And I really like using that method of communicating with you between videos. So go follow me on Instagram if you haven't already. And yeah, I'm kind of sad. And it's going to be weird, but I think it's also going to be really good. And then starting in February, I'll be like refreshed, creatively, like rounded out, um, clear headed, ready to tackle 2024 and make it our best, our best year yet, honestly. So let me know what you think about all of this in the comment section. <laughs> Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already. Have an amazing, amazing rest of your year. And I will see you in 2024. Until then, stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. Bye. I love you all. <laughs> I miss you, but I love you. Okay. Bye. You hang up first. No, I'm going to hang up. You hang up first. You hang up first. You hang up first. I'll wait. You get out of this video. I can't leave you like this. Bye, guys. <laughs>
So you got to let it go I got blood 